So um, I think the key thing for this webinar is that we want to make links between the presentations. We're developing a social pedagogy for the UK. We want to um, be thinking about how the German concepts and the English concepts and practices all interact. What's the common ground? Where are the divergences? Where should we be going with the, with the collaboration after, after today? So, um, and at the very end, we'll invite Robin Kemp from SPA to, to give some details about, about what SPA is up to. But first of all, um, We'll get going. And, and Christian, could you introduce yourself? So, unmute yourself. So I have to unmute first. So welcome, everybody. Nice uh, that I can be part of that seminar. As Claire already said, I would have been into the UK for this week, but this was not possible. But I think we made a good solution and found a good way to deal with the situation. And it's very interesting to see what happened out of it. I'm coming from uh, Bremen, University of Applied Science at the city of Bremen in Germany. And I'm a social worker and social pedagogue myself. And as I, uh, as Claire already was mentioning, when we talk about social work in Germany, we always include social work and social pedagogy. So actually we teach both fields at our university. But I have always been more inclined to that social pedagogy side, I must say. So I started working in a residential care home for young children. And then I worked with uh, youth in a media project. And after that, I did youth work in a community oriented youth work project, kind of a settlement, you could say, in Berlin. And in that field, I also discovered that spatial approach. So for me, it was interesting to think about youth work in a community dimension. And that was bringing me to the topic of social spaces. And I'm glad that we have the opportunity to talk today about social pedagogy and the spatial approaches, and that we have the possibility to compare the approaches in the different countries. I think that's gonna be very interesting. So I'm very curious to hear what you think about the presentations and then also the discussion. So it's gonna be very, interesting to have that uh, comparing perspective. But now I will uh, pass on back to Adriana to uh, start the film. Thanks very much. Hello and welcome to this lecture series on social pedagogy and spatial approaches, an introduction from a German perspective. This is the first part of a two-part lecture designed for a webinar, Social Pedagogy and Spatial Approaches in Germany and England, Concepts and Practice. The webinar has been hosted by SPA, Social Pedagogy Professional Association, and the UCL Institute of Education, University College London. My name is Christian Spacek. I'm a professor of theories and methods of social work at Hochschule Bremen, City University of Applied Sciences. I'm teaching there in the Faculty of Social Work and uh, the School of Social Work. Um, my background is I'm a social pedagogue and a social worker, and I'm very happy to talk about that approaches from a German perspective to bring it more into an international discussion. Beginning with the question, what is social pedagogy? I have to say it's not an easy question, and actually the public uh, discourse on social pedagogy in Germany is unclear on that question. So I have to say we don't know either, actually. But uh, what I can try is uh, identify what social pedagogy means to me and why it's relevant to me and my uh, personal activities in academic and uh, practice fields of social pedagogy. For me, it's uh, the key idea that uh, social problems are dealt with educational means. I think that's the key issue, the key topic of social pedagogy. Social problems are not just to be dealt with maybe resources or counseling or social welfare, but also by means of educational intervention, learning, development. Therefore, it's also a kind of social philosophy and social ethics, as Sandermann and Neumann also stress in their book. Of course, the <clears throat> very classic definition of Karl Mager is very helpful. Karl Mager has been coining the term social pedagogy in 1844 in a journal. And he said, 
social pedagogy is not just individual pedagogy, but also a pedagogy for and with the state and the collective. So he brings together the individual, the state and the collective. And I think that's very relevant for social pedagogy until today. Another helpful definition comes from Franz Hamburger. He says, social pedagogy deals with, deals with the relationship between the individual and society and the conflicts and the solutions that might emerge in that relationship. So social work is mediating between individual and society and helps solving conflicts, solving problems with professional solutions. Another helpful idea comes from Philippe Cousset and other authors from Belgium and Germany. In a journal or book chapter, they uh, follow the idea of the repedagogization of social problems. Social problems should be dealt with pedagogical interventions. And also they stress the idea of resocialization of social conflict. So they say social conflicts are not just individual and subjective problems, but are social problems in society and therefore they need to be solved and designed in social situations. A last uh, key idea for myself <clears throat> is the idea of Bildung. Bildung is a special term that can't be translated easily into English. <clears throat> but I would say it's a mix between education and development. It's a kind of education from the within. So people are following their aspirations, their potentials and develop themselves, selves like maybe like a plant that's growing and knowing how to grow. So it's a developmental approach to humans and the idea is to bring the subjectivity back into the field and also maybe make humans more be able to, full, to fulfill their full potential and meet their aspirations. And it's important, it's according to one's understanding. So it's not about others that decide, but the subject himself, herself can decide what's relevant. Therefore, <clears throat> it's necessary to negotiate those aspirations. It's clear, it, it also leads to conflicts, to maybe a lack of resources, a lack of access to certain things. Therefore, we need to negotiate. We need to have democratic solutions for uh, be becoming a subject in society and also being different subjects in society. So these have been some key ideas of the definitions of social pedagogy. What I also need to stress is, of course, the context of social pedagogy in Germany. I think it's important to understand that in Germany, we always talk about soziale Arbeit, which is a roof term or umbrella term for social work, social Arbeit, and social pedagogy, social pedagogic. So we can see <clears throat> from history until maybe the early 1990s, we have been having two different branches. First, uh, the first one we call social work, social Arbeit, that was focused on working with adults, uh, working with poverty, exclusion, uh, mainly focused on helping people, and has been connected also to certain movements in history, often to the women's movement, the social movement, the peace movement, and maybe also to figures like Alice Salomon, or maybe also Jane Addams or Mary Richmond. But then again, we had the same development parallel in social pedagogy, an intervention that was directed to the young people of the poor. So from the Middle Ages on until today, we have the tradition to say it needs special interventions for young people and uh, they are focused on education, on building, on inclusion of young people. So therefore it's a kind of social education that is, has always been connected also to movements, especially here the youth movements and the movements about progressive and alternative education. So we are still coming from that history, but since the 1990s, we had a decision, at least in higher education, to make a convergence out of it, to call it soziale Arbeit, social work as an umbrella. And, uh, and since then, we have only programs in social work in university. So if you do a bachelor or master in social work, soziale Arbeit, then you study social work and social pedagogy, and it's up to the student or the colleague what they might specialize in, in which field. So social work as soziale Arbeit leads to a qualification for both fields, social work and social pedagogy. 
Therefore, I also would say social pedagogy is a part of soziale Arbeit, social work, and follows more the aspects of education, of learning, of development, whereas social Arbeit focuses more on helping, maybe on counseling, maybe on providing resources to people. I think both approaches are important. It's rather a question, which question do we have, which task, which field of action, which problem do we have? But both approaches are viable and helpful, I would say. So this clarifies maybe what I mean when I talk about social pedagogy in the German system of higher education, but also in the German welfare system. Another important classic uh, discussion has been the discussion between Natorp and Nol. I think it's an ongoing discussion because it deals with the question, how far does social pedagogy need to reach into society? And we have a first answer from Paul Nartorp. He says very far. He would say man only becomes man through community. And therefore, social pedagogy needs to intervene into community in society. He started with the assumption that the social question is not just material poverty, but also a lack of community or social cohesion. And therefore, we need uh, people that are building ideals and just communities through the intervention of social pedagogy. In that sense, we are all social pedagogues, also maybe a teacher or a medical doctor or other professions would be social pedagogues in dealing with a just and ideal community and society. And social pedagogy would rather be a very general and broad approach across all disciplines. Then we have the counterpart, Hermann Nohl and also Gertrude Bäumer. They were focusing on the idea to say social pedagogy is just a theory of the field of youth welfare, child and youth welfare. And Gertrude Bäumer also said uh, social pedagogy is education that's not happening in school or family. It's just beyond that uh, two fields. So it's basically the pedagogy of child and youth welfare. So they would rather focus it on a special, very specialized field with a special professional group and say that's where social pedagogy should happen. They were also following the ideas of hermeneutics, the understanding of uh, situations, not the explanation, but the deeper understanding. And I think that's a key idea that's also maybe coming later in my slides. So hermeneutics is an approach of maybe how to address the situation from philosophy of science. But uh, the general debate here we can follow is uh, how far should social pedagogy go or reach into society? And of course, as you can see in my later slides, I would always follow the idea of Paul Nartorp. I think it's more important to go broader in society and also to have social pedagogy as a broad and maybe multi-professional, interprofessional uh, intervention. And I wouldn't just re uh, reduce it on child and youth welfare. For me, I found uh, social pedagogy has also been very important in the sense of critical and emancipatory approaches. They have been starting, of course, with the, with the students' movement of 1968 and the big changes in society in that times. So also from 19, late 60s, early 70s on, you find Hermann Giesecke, Klaus Mollenhauer, Hans Thiersch changing social pedagogy from just an hermeneutic understanding approach to a critical approach that's critical or radical towards power, towards oppression, towards hegemony in society. And Hans Thiersch did that also with his term of the everyday, the Alltag. So he would say we need to discover and understand the everyday, the Alltag, and also the life world of people, the subjective individual life worlds of people. Then we can really uh, find a good approach and also connect to the people and then develop a critical question out of that dialogue, out of that meeting. So for me, the idea of life world has been very supportive and helpful in understanding social pedagogy. In that sense, you can say what we have here is a critical phenomenological approach, critical in the sense of the Frankfurt School of Social Sciences, radical critical approaches towards power and oppression, 
But also we have that phenomenological approaches, maybe like Alfred Schütz or other social phenomenologists that say, we need to go deeper in the situation. We need to understand, we need to discover, we need to reconstruct situations and learn about them. And then we have a deeper understanding about life worlds in the situation. Tiersch also follows the differentiation from Habermas between life world and system and says, Social pedagogy mediates between life world, the subjective life world of our addressees, our target groups, and the system, maybe the public system, the institutions, the organizations, the associations, and so on. And from Hans Tiersch, I especially learned more about discovery of subjective life worlds, and then, of course, a critical reflection of that situation together with the clients, and then the idea of leading that into action, into participation, into development of situation. So it's also about political participation and about changing structures and situations. Another protagonist from critical emancipatory approaches is Lothar Bönisch. From him, I learned about the coping paradigm. Coping, he would say, is more than maybe just getting along with the situation. He would say, Coping is a synthesis of biographical situations and maybe experiences and the social situation, also a class position, also the social situation in society. It's also called Lebenslage. So it's about the class situation in society, a position. And he comes from the idea of social change and dislocation. So he says changes often need, lead to dislocation, to disembedded situations. People are getting problems if they are excluded in change processes. And in that situation, they need uh, strategies of coping. And maybe they are good or bad ones. Maybe they are accepted and non-accepted strategies of coping. So the idea is to learn accepted ones and also maybe to mediate uh, uncommon coping strategies to other people. He also says social pedagogy needs to look or differ on certain life ages. So he has a big uh, social pedagogy on different ages like children, young children or older children, or it's also different maybe for youth or for adults or for high aged people. So he would differ between the life ages in social pedagogy. And from Lothar Bönisch, I also learned about a very strong connection to social policy. I think it's necessary to connect social pedagogy always to social policy, and you can't differ between the two. And social policy needs to create a good framework that keeps people safe and makes them able to work and develop, and then they can develop on their own. A third uh, critical emancipatory approach comes from Michael Winkler. From him, I learned about the subject orientation of social pedagogy. Maybe that goes a bit back to the idea of uh, Paul Nartop. He also would say uh, the subject needs to develop autonomy. I think it's a Kantian idea from Immanuel Kant. Subjects need to be able to develop the full potential and become autonomous subjectives. Autonomous in the sense of giving oneself his own or her own rules, not being completely independent, but being able to decide wisely about good uh, solutions. It's also about mündigkeit, about the ability to be autonomous, to design and uh, shape the situation. And Michael Winkler says that always happens in tensions between individual and society. And social pedagogy needs to create place-related solutions, place-related interventions. He calls it, calls it Ortshandeln, acting in places. And that's uh, what social pedagogues should create, uh, situations and settings for place-related interventions that enables people to become full subjects and uh, develop their subjectivity. So this is uh, the three critical emancipatory authors that have been helping my understanding of social pedagogy very much. And a last outlook maybe I found from Lothar Bönisch. Uh, we have been hearing a lot about green social work in the last years. And uh, here is another book from Lothar Bönisch that maybe goes more into social pedagogy and that issue. He developed a social pedagogy of the sustainability and says, 
we have to find a new way of social sustainability in the situation of the Anthropocene, in the situation where we live in a man-made world that has been shaped and designed by man-made interventions for the good and the bad. And now we have maybe a kind of paradise lost situation. We can't go back to a unique, innocent connection to nature. We have a lot of problems of climate change, of peak everything, of peak of all resources. We experience a lot of global crisis. And that, of course, leads to helplessness, to open questions, to search for orientation, and to search for a new approach for living a good life, maybe also good quality of life. So he would say we need new approaches from social pedagogy and he stresses very much the idea of a much more connected thinking, of a much more systemic uh, connected approach. And also he is very much dealing with the idea of degrowth or post growth. We need to find a new relation to our growth in society and the common economy. And we need a new definition, what's a good life, what's quality of life. And that, he says, are new tasks for education and development and also social policy. So, of course, it's a key task for social pedagogy. And it could be interesting to talk more about that uh, situation uh, for social pedagogy in the current uh, city of the global situation. So that has been a big overview on, on some key ideas of social pedagogy. If I would have to summarize it, I would say social pedagogy for me is an approach that helps uh, meeting people in their development, in their uh, personal subjective development in a social context. So it brings together the individual in its wish and desires and potentials for development. And of course, always an analysis of the social society and the task to change and develop that together. So it's a democratic task and it's a task about participation, about really uh, making a difference and finding solutions for problems that are emerging in that relationship. So this was my first part about social pedagogy. Thanks very much for your attention and I'm looking forward on the discussion. I also have integrated my contact data, so if you have any questions or requests, feel free to contact me. And also I have included the list of references. These are the books I have used for that presentation. Maybe you find some helpful resources. Thanks very much and goodbye. Um. And so now we've we've got quite a lot of comments coming through on the um, on the chat box. I'll just start with a few things that I picked out, and then um, maybe other people have have things that they want to, to contribute. So um, the first thing that people started talking about was the NATO versus null, and um, you know where. Where should we be pitching social pedagogy? Is it an individually focused, relationship focused thing around children and youth? Or are we talking about a broader, um, more challenging, politically engaging um, approach? And, and if we are talking about that, then, then how? How do we move? How do we move with that, um, with that topic and that, um, that challenge? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, that's also an uh, ongoing uh, debate and a kind of field of tension. And uh, I also would favor an ARTORP, but if I watch the everyday practice, I see a lot of null, of course, because in practice it's often reduced to help maybe a group or individuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the big perspective on society and changing really the conditions uh, is not often reached or is uh, only sometimes reached maybe. But the ideal or the idea or maybe the vision also when I'm teaching is always to go to the broader perspective. So I think we should not uh, forget that. So that's uh, my uh, background to the situation. So the more towards NATO, the better I would say. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody want to come in on the question of NATO versus null and um, this for me, the real challenge is that in, in the UK, we developed social pedagogy around 
children in in conditions of residential care and foster care and so on and very much focusing on the relational environment in which they uh, are living and to shift that to the political domain is it's a it's, it's been quite difficult to do that, particularly in an unreceptive policy environment um, that we've had for the last 10 years. And, uh, and so, you know, I, has anybody got any bright ideas, particularly if I'm thinking about the current situation and how moments of crisis can be transformative moments or they can just reproduce the existing relations of society. And um, anybody's thoughts on, on how one might go forward with um, that, you may unmute if you want, wish to speak now and, uh, and, and make a contribution. Robin? <laughs> uh, I'll, can I make a contribution? Yes. Oh, sorry, Lois. Down it's, there. Right. <laughs> um, it's funny because me and Ali have been kind of having these conversations just recently about kind of crisis and social pedagogy and what's kind of going on in practice. And I think. Um, and Gabriel's kind of touched on it in the comments, is that there's no mention of evidence-based practice. And I think this is really interesting at the minute, because I think we've, we've gone down this uh, route of evidence-based practice and what works. And it means that when we come to crisis, we are looking for manuals and, and ways forward. And actually what we need is, we need to be, and somebody mentioned Bauman, and it yeah. is that thing about being able to sit with uncertainty and find people where they are. So I think for me, life world orientation is, is so, and hermeneutics, so important. Mm -hmm. And it's finding people where they are and being alongside people so that then we feel comfortable enough to, to have just to go with things and not feel like we need processes and procedures that tell us exactly what to do. Because as we're finding now, none of us know what we're doing. We're just no. finding our way, aren't we? And I think, like you said, there's some, this might bring some really exciting practice developments and yeah. might allow people a bit more freedom. I mean, I don't know, what do other people think? Any others people would like to contribute at this moment? <coughs> yeah. Uh, oh. Robin, hello. Oh, who else was there? Sorry. Um, I, uh, uh, me, Bronya. Ah, oh, Bronya, you go and I'll go after you. Uh, no, I prefer you, you were first. <laughs> 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 We're so polite. Um, I, I think um, too, it's really interesting. I, I think um, while the um, NATORP idea or NATORP idea is is really central, what we've done is we've we've gone more with Noel and Bauman, but probably because we've started with children's services. Yeah. Um, but I think um, it is really interesting. There's a, there's a bit of a new debate going on in academic circles about experience-based intervention, uh, um, based practice and experience-based research uh, having a, a, a stronger stage rather than randomised controlled trials, which were based on a drug, um, how we figure out drugs rather than how we figure out social relationships. So um, I think that's that's really interesting. I don't think it's a matter of, of um, NATOP or NOL. It, 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 we have to combine the two, um, but it, it is difficult in this current political situation. But like you say, Claire, absolutely, there is opportunity in this crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of my social pedagogy colleagues are thinking, this is the time that we mm -hmm. get in there with the mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. Well, it's certainly a vacuum one can fill. <laughs> Um, uh, Christian, I'm just going to ask about this evidence-based mm -hmm. interventions. Um, are they common in Germany? Do you have them in a social pedagogic context? Mm -hmm. Evidence-based interventions in family lives or social relations? Yeah, uh, not so much. Uh, they have been discussed maybe also for 10, 15 years, but they didn't reach the practice really. So in practice, we still have much more on experience-based approaches or it's more open to the professional what's good or relevant so we are always a bit afraid of uh, getting that discussion more into practice because we see a lot of bad effects of standardization and bureaucratization and of technology approaches that are not very much uh, rela relational approaches so mm -hmm. we are often afraid that it could come more but so mm -hmm. far we kind of managed to 
live without uh, a strong dominance of that approaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also think we should go deeper because uh, of course also the approaches I have been presenting are dealing with evidence, but it's, it's a different idea of evidence. It's not mm -hmm. positivism, it's uh, hermeneutics, it's phenomenology, it's critical theory. And all the three approaches are also dealing with knowledge and with uh, objectivity and with uh, also evidence, but it's, it's a different approach to evidence, mm -hmm. more to understand things. The phenomenologists even would doubt that we can recognize everything. It, it's a process, and I think that's what we need more, process and relational uh, approaches and uh, to get in that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we also could say that's also evidence, that's also scientific, that's also uh, object, objectivistic, but it's a different idea of knowledge. Maybe that helps yeah. getting the discussion broader. But I'm always afraid because uh, evidence-based practice sounds much more uh, effective and mm -hmm. uh, economists like it and uh, managers like it. So you can have a top-down uh, order, so it's attractive. But uh, the practice and the clients are still a bit resistant, I would say, in Germany. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so another comment that I um, picked out was... Uh, Haltong. Mm -hmm. You haven't mentioned Haltong, yeah. and yeah. Uh, one of the comments here was that Haltong is quite helpful uh, mm -hmm. as a mindset. I'm just wondering what your take on, on Haltong is in yeah. relation to your yeah. um, critical pedagogy approach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I was just uh, reading that book, Lois. I think you recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> I found, uh, you have been uh, using the term of Haltung, the term and term. So, yeah interesting and uh, when I teach uh, methods of social work and social pedagogy I also have a, a trias we call it uh, knowledge and uh, ability or competence and haltung we call it wissen können haltung so the three should go together the knowledge and the competence and the maybe values or mindset of a person and that makes maybe a good social worker. So for me, Haltung is very important because it's a certain way of dealing with values, with uh, uh, kind of personal attachment also to the situation. And I think only knowledge and only competences are too less. So we need Haltung. We need mm -hmm. to talk about mm -hmm. more about Haltung. And I think that also resonates in both social work and social pedagogy, because in both fields we talk a lot about values and ethics and uh, moral, and I think we should uh, use that uh, level as well. So for me, it's a very important reference, despite it's a bit difficult to teach because you can't order a certain haltung or you can't make a certain haltung. So it's about reflecting oneself. Maybe that's the task. But it's interesting that that term is uh, showing up again. Yeah, and, and it's, it's um, something that in the UK we've had to uh, struggle to understand and to make and make real because it's, it's, there isn't a very good translation into English. So we have to mm -hmm. probe what the definition is in, in, the, in the German and try and make it happen. Um, and as... Um, Lois has just said she's hoping that there will be an article about Haltong in, in the International Journal of Social Pedagogy coming out soon. Mm -hmm. um, so that the, the debate will continue. Unless anyone's got any burning questions they'd like to ask to add in now, I think it's time to move on to the second part mm -hmm. of the lecture. Mm -hmm. um, Do you mind anybody? if I ask something? Yeah. Bronya wanted to ask something. Okay, Bronya. Uh, well, yes. Well, I was listening to um, the, the answer related to the combining the both, both approach, the individual and society. And uh, just because I live in different countries, I, uh, I would like to mention that, it, to think in the contextual, um, obviously the historical and contextual background of each society will point at different interventions and that that will be uh, potentially a good way to 
to see the pedagogy more effective. And yes, because as as we said, um, the, this political a political understanding and the way we we actually we live in in, in these particular times, and the fact that we don't have um, um, many ways to deal it, we have to potentially wait for uh, somebody decide for us. So that becomes literally, personally, I think it's a, a crisis. Uh, it's a humanity crisis that we're facing, an ethical crisis, in my opinion. And just wanted to ask Christian um, his opinion on, on this matter. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I also read in the chat, I think it's possible to combine Natrop and Noel, mm. and maybe to work in practice, first of all, very pragmatic to get what you have and maybe m uh, make a good work with uh, individual clients like Noel would say, but uh, still to keep Natorp in mind and maybe find little spaces of possibility or spaces where you can change something or it, it's sometimes little windows. Sometimes also at the moment crisis could be also a possibility. I think it's always important to look in crisis what's possible, what's uh, there. And uh, we also say that uh, in social pedagogy it's like a, a real utopia. So it's an, an utopia, it's very visionary, but it's a real utopia. It's possible, it would be possible. So I think that helps sometimes uh, keeping the vision and still working pragmatic in the everyday frontline work situations that you experience. And I think that's a good way to bring it together. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's often helpful to have more supportive conditions, but I think it's also possible to go small steps and keep the bigger aim in vision. So that's what I mm -hmm. try to also mediate in teaching and in, in the practice. And it also helped me in the situation when I was working, uh, of, yeah, working successfully and happy and convinced what I'm about what I was doing. Mm. So it's always a, a compromise, but I think it's possible. Maybe that's Thank my you. haltung to that situation. One last question is from Jamil. Mm -hmm. um, Jamil, do you want to unmute and just say what you wanted to say? He says, Hello, yeah, 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 thank you, um, Christian. That was really helpful. Um, I suppose I kind of, um, my, my first question is about the Altag, the everyday, and what it actually means in, in practice, if you could say a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. And also, this, um, I mean, I think there is a tension in applying social pedagogy in the conditions in the UK mm -hmm. and I suppose my question to you and others is is um, is seeking to influence the relationship between the individual and society a core feature of social pedagogy or is it or, or is it negotiable on the basis that social pedagogies um, that we're unable to exactly define it and it kind of leads me to kind of that question for me is kind of quite central and it leads me to think about how maybe the approach needs to be outside it needs to start in the community rather than to start in the services mm -hmm. if you're going to achieve that mm -hmm. and I think it's hard to do when you start with statutory services mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, just your thoughts okay. on that. Yeah. Okay. And that really uh, must be the last question. Yeah. To the Alltag, I think uh, that idea is coming originally from Alfred Schütz, and uh, he would say uh, uh, if I observe something, it's not obvious what I see. I need to have more an ongoing contact to it and go deeper and experience uh, the situation. And that's maybe that what. Uh, Hans Thiersten was thinking about the Alltag, the everyday life of people. So it would mean you go into relation and you need more time to observe a situation and you don't have ready-made assumptions but try to be as open as possible. 
we are always a bit uh, prejudicing, but uh, still to be as open as possible and also to maybe change uh, your attitude when you have new experiences. So it's more about experiencing and less about explaining or certainly knowing. And also, I think that connects to the second part of the question. The, I think the core of the question would be, do I have the possibility to negotiate with my clients and target groups? Do I have the freedom to decide, is it risky or not? Or do I have the freedom to deal with uncertainty, with open situations? And I think that's what we need uh, to do social work. And as far as I understand in the UK, it's often difficult to get that uh, freedoms and to have that possibility. It's much more regulated, much more standardized, much more manual based. And of course, a manual doesn't meet an Alltag because it's a completely different uh, approach. But uh, therefore, you might be right, you have to find windows where you can apply that understanding and relational approach, maybe in the community, maybe in everyday situations, maybe also connected to social movements. I think that's necessary to work in that way, at least to have a certain grade of autonomy as a social worker. And I think that's a challenge. Yeah, but your next presentation will mm -hmm. tell us something about working in community. Yeah. So um, let's move to that yeah. and then return to these questions in the general discussion. Yeah. Hello and welcome back to the second part of the lecture, Social Pedagogy and Spatial Approaches, an introduction from a German perspective. This is part two of a webinar uh, under the title of Social Pedagogy and Spatial Approaches in Germany and England, Concepts and Practice. That webinar has been hosted by ESPA, Social Pedagogy Professional Association, and the UCL Institute of Inst Education, at University College London. My name is Christian Spacek. I'm a professor of theories and methods of social work at Hochschule Bremen, University of Applied Sciences in Germany. I'm a prof uh, professor for theories and methods of social work. I am a social pedagogue and a social worker, and I try to talk about the spatial approaches. My second part is about spatial approaches from a German perspective. The spatial paradigm in social pedagogy has been introduced, especially since the late 1990s in the debate of social pedagogy in Germany. You can find uh, many different routes for that. Of course, we have a broader discourse on radical social geography also from the 1970s, especially authors like Henri Lefebvre, David Harvey, Doreen Massey, Bruno Latour, Edward Soja and others had been coining ideas of social ge geography and also about radical and critical geography. But uh, what makes it special here is that uh, authors like Ulrich Deinert, Christian Reutlinger, Lothar Bönisch and Hans Thiersch brought that ideas in the debate of social pedagogy. Ulrich Deinert comes from a background of youth work and he has been following the idea of acquirement, of acquiring spaces very much. Christian Reutlinger comes from social pedagogy and social geography and he is very much focused on the idea of social development, of developing spaces. And maybe some more founding fathers had been Hans Thiersch and Lothar Bönisch. You can remember them from the first part of the lecture. Hans Thiersch is very much interested in the life world of people and the social phenomenology of phenomenology of life worlds to discover, to understand deeper what's happening in the subjective life world of people. And Lothar Bönisch, he's very much following the idea of coping, coping as a biographical and social process. So these are authors that have been bringing that idea maybe into the debate of social pedagogy. <clears throat> the big uh, focus is uh, that uh, it's a relational approach. First of all, the saying of the case of the field remarks maybe quite well what, what's it about. It's uh, about going away from the individualistic perspective of, of a single case to see that all of the cases have a field, have a surrounding, a neighborhood, a space around them. 
So it's maybe uh, a goodbye to individualistic approaches and then hello to multi-level approaches. So spatial approaches want to be relational multi-level approaches. And the idea is in spaces, we find a lot of possible resources, networks, solutions. We only have to realize them. We only have to find them and discover them. So that's the big task of spatial approaches to discover those potential of spaces. Therefore, we had uh, maybe a new perspective. We need to think more complex, more connected, maybe more ecological, more systemic, more connected in multi-level um, patterns, not just a single case. And this could lead to a change in the work relation with clients and target groups, but also in institutions, organizations, and also public life. So you can see on the picture the situation, football playing is forbidden. That could be a good example to discover, okay, what could be done to change that situation? What could be done in that situation? And of course, when we go spatial, we go relational. We need to get uh, relations into the focus. Spaces are relations. Spaces are made by relations of people and interaction and acting in spatial settings. So spaces make rules, but they can also be changed. They can be modified. They can be designed by people. So therefore, they are dynamic. The idea is to change something, to develop something towards the better, to the idea maybe of kind of social pedagogy to help uh, people develop themselves, to become subjects and to learn and to discover what could be done to make it better. Spaces always have two kinds of dimensions. First of all, of course, they have material and concrete environments. Spaces are uh, designed uh, by buildings, by social classes, by rules, by stratification, by ex structures, exclusion, inclusion, by power, by discourses. So spaces have objective conditions, so to say, that can't be changed. But then again, spaces always have that subjective situation. So such a quarter like the Viertel in Bremen, you can see on the picture, is always also designed by subjective life worlds, by individual perspectives, by the constructs of people, what they make of it, what they think about it, what they feel about it, what they experience there in their subjective life world. So spatial approaches need to bring together both perspectives to say what are the material objective conditions, but also what are the subjective individual life world related individual perspectives and to see how they relate, how they position, how they interact together. So spaces are regarded as a synthesis of conditions and action. And the interesting part would be to discover them, to realize them, to learn about them. Another key idea following of the idea of Ulrich Deinert is the idea of acquirement. Acquirement is a simple thing. People acquire spaces, they make them theirs, they act there and they design there. We have one example here from youth work from Germany. We ask young people, what do you want on that space and, and the public place? What do you want there? It's a boring place. You can see a very gray and not very nice place. And young people said, okay, we want a fairground, for example. We want to have uh, activities there. We want to meet, we want to be happy. We want to enjoy ourselves. We want to have fun and maybe some interaction in that place. So on that project, we could uh, follow that idea and design that space. We couldn't uh, create a permanent fairground, but we could create meeting places. We could create uh, benches to sit. We could uh, uh, have a mobile playing uh, solution for children and other activities. So the idea is to acquire a place, to make it one's place, to make it uh, according to one's needs, interests, uh, and to design a space. And acquirement is also always learning. It's about also participation, about being part of the place, about democracy, about uh, being integrated and included in a place. So if you make a place yours, you're also maybe designing and negotiating that place. It's uh, sometimes also about conflicts and conflicts have to be solved in a participatory and democratic way. 
but it's possible to make changes of places. The discourse of acquirement also went into the idea of spatial learning settings. So you can find a lot of books in the German debate about the acquirement of spaces and how they can be used for common democratic public learning and uh, also to change uh, public life, but also spaces can be institutions, organizations, local settings, so both uh, levels could be applied in that approach. And space is clearly a task in the reference for social pedagogy in the sense of designing and shaping a space. It's about a democratic and possibly public design of spaces. And maybe the counterpart of acquirement is the idea of alienation. So if you can't acquire a place, you get alienated, you get uh, dislocated from a place, you get uh, disconnected, you get disengaged. And of course, that's the thing social pedagogues want to avoid. And uh, it's especially difficult to find acquirement in times of highly accelerated and highly uh, competitive places. And Hartmut Rosa also comes back to the idea of resonance. We need to find the resonance with the place, then we can acquire a place. We need time, we need a bit of interest of muse of uh, connection to a place. How can analysis of spaces be designed? That's an important question also for practitioners of social workers, but also for uh, research and social work. How can we learn about spatial settings? And the debate found a lot of different methods for that. All of them are rather, you can see in a focus in a qualitative approach, they are very highly reconstructive approaches. But also we need some quantitative approaches maybe to gain more about information about the, uh, the general conditions of places, the, the geographical and the social data and the quantitative data on the social structure of a place. But most of the methods are qualitative ones, maybe walks or observances or methods like the needle method where you put needles in a special place where you like to be, where you don't like to be, where you're afraid, where you're happy. So we ask young people often to needle their places on maps. The auto photography is about uh, photographing your place. People take mobile phones and photograph their favorite places, maybe hidden places, like children meet on hidden places or certain target groups have certain places they might want to show. We work with diaries, with time budgets that measure time uh, parts of activities, mental maps, subjective maps that are drawn maps about individual perceptions of spaces, narrations, interviews, institutional analysis, and grids are tables of uh, certain categories like youth cultures and peer groups or maybe certain groups of a neighborhood that can be measured in grids and visualized. So all of them make visible the life world uh, background of spaces and the subjective and individual perceptions. Examples for projects could be <clears throat> that you always take a certain target group and then see and discover what's useful and interesting for them. So examples could be doing city walks and maybe also other forms of interviews with older people, expert interviews to discover participation in local neighborhood to identify what, where are old people going, what do they need, where they, do they find barriers, what are their perceived interests and needs in the neighborhood. Another example could be using needles and peer group grids to learn more about young people, youth cultures, peer groups and public meeting places and conflicts there and maybe different youth cultures that compete on a certain place. That could be a kind of update for adults, maybe teachers, youth workers, other people and also maybe the public. Mental maps and questionnaires we use often to discover places like school campuses or neighborhoods or organizations, institutions. Here is an example of school social work to find out about, about subjective places and relevant topics of young people in school that are hidden maybe to teachers and other people. Other possibilities could be, for example, in the, the probation services to work with photographs and show 
how do young people live after being uh, released from uh, uh, from uh, prison and uh, coming back into society? What do they face? What do they meet? What prejudices do they meet? Which problems, but also with potentials, with interests, and to draw and create portraits in maybe a local exhibition or also online or any other form that's suitable for the target group and meeting the uh, requirements of data protection. Or another example could be teaching projects like one we did uh, about urban development of certain neighborhoods in Bremen. We used expert interviews with, with local experts. We did observation in public places. We did even countings of people and activities like walking, meeting, sitting, uh, talking, shopping, and so on. And we found out about local quality of life uh, of local spaces in certain neighborhoods, maybe different neighborhoods in one city. And there are many other possibilities. These are just some examples for that. How could that be used for concept development or intervention? <clears throat> of course, the social space analysis needs to have uh, a certain pattern. Usually it's a research question, then we identify tools and do or create a research design. Then, of course, we collect data on a broader basis and then we interpret data. But then that interpretation is not just a research project. Often it's connected to a special organization, to a certain institution, to certain target groups. And therefore, this goes on in a collection and presentation of the main results of the study. And then uh, maybe a common conclusion, a common uh, design of aims in a participatory process. It's often to important to participate, all stakeholders, all the target groups, all institutions. Then those aims are, those conclusions are operationalized into aims and strategies are developed. Again, here it's important to participate, all stakeholders, all target groups. Then, of course, there's implementation and then there's reflection, maybe reflection again, implementation and so on. So it's important to maybe have a kind of pioneer to have a kind of pilot and then we have a test pilot and uh, we see if it's working, if it's feasible, and then we redesign and reflect again. So it's important to bring all those knowledge then into the special situation. So that could be how uh, spatial analysis could be used for concept development in special or certain situations of organizations, institutions, neighborhoods, communities, stakeholders in any kind. And that leads maybe to the last uh, idea. If we do that, we have something that's called socio-spatial work. Christian Reutlinger and Hildegard Wicker call it socio-spatial work. We need to have new interventions from spatial settings. We have more relations, we have more uh, discovery of resources, potentials in the life world. We learn about acquirement processes. We need to learn more about community. This maybe leads then to new structures of services, organizations, institutions. There we need also more flexible approaches, more cooperative approaches. Those uh, uh, relations need to have uh, resemblance in the organization level. And then, of course, that also maybe has influences into the design of places, like in the planning processes, in the decision making, in the policy making, and uh, also maybe in architecture and building of places. So that all goes together and that all belongs together in a certain way. So that's the big idea of the spatial approach. Maybe as a summary, I think spatial approaches want to discover spatial settings and uh, learn about spatial local situations, find and identify many possibilities as possible for acquirement, for learning, development, change, and then bring that uh, idea into the design of spaces and to change and develop spaces. So we have an idea of social development on a participatory level. This is the participational uh, approach that we need to follow in spatial work. So this was the presentation about the spatial approach in social pedagogy. Thanks very much. And uh, I think it's always interesting to hear about your experiences. And now we could go into a broader discussion. 
again, we have that uh, contact data. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or results or demands. And again, we have the references I have used in the presentation. And thanks very much for being part of that. We'll move on to St. Christopher's. Um, Cecile and colleagues, I think, or is that just Cecile going to present? Yeah, that's right. Uh, two of us from the participation team in uh, St. Christopher's, Matt uh, and myself. And I think Matt, you were going to start, weren't you? I am, yeah, as long as everybody can hear me okay. Everybody okay? Yeah, far away, Natalie, well. got 10 minutes. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we thought after uh, watching those uh, two separate links that it would probably be useful, um, as Christian did in the beginning, to talk about what social pedagogy is um, for him. We kind of had a thought about what social pedagogy is at St Christopher's. So several years ago, St Christopher's uh, made a strong shift to use social pedagogy as an overall framework. Um, and an approach to care and, and a considerable effort to embed it into everyday practice. Um, I would say more recently there are changes in the organisation and uh, probably a refocus on work towards consolidating financial sustainability. So that was accompanied by a diversification of core services that we offer. So education services, community-based support for young people um, in and at the edge of care and also the criminal system. Uh, the organisation is setting up a wraparound team whose remit is to support the emotional and mental health of staff teams and the young people themselves based on attachment theory and relational wellbeing. So the new impetus in the organisation means that some of the priorities have shifted a little and people are learning to adopt to new ways of working. But there are still a small group of people who are really continuing to think um, socially, pedagogically about their practice and also about how to keep social pedag pedagogy as a topic of focus for the whole organisation. Um, a little about the, uh, so myself and Cecilia from the participation team and a little about the participation team. So we're made up of people in the UK and one in the Isle of Man. Uh, we spend time listening to young people and understanding what's important to them so that we can then work with the teams in the homes to try and give young people a sense of control over their situation, building on a feeling of empowerment. Uh, the roles within the team are funded through grants from Children in Need and the Esme Fairburn Foundation. So projects can focus on developing life skills, transitions to other services and also to a more independent lifestyle once young people leave our, our children's homes or our 16 plus services. Um, we also then thought a little about uh, some of the things that we use within our work and one of the concepts we really focus this one is the rich child. Um, we rely on that within the participating team. So the image of the rich child, we start from assumption that children and young people are capable, socially connected and full of potential. Um, it's a conscious decision that, that we make, a choice that we then follow through logically when working alongside a young person and probably something we also use to support the teams and help with the professionals see. Um, it also means we avoid thinking in terms of needs and where the child can be uh, passive and the role of the adult is then to meet that need. So instead we try and focus on the young person's capacity for action and their understanding of the possibilities they see around them for a different life. Um, our role appreciates that young people can be experts in their own lives. Um, we work alongside them to unfold that potential really. Um, Cecile is now going to talk a little bit about um, acquirement, so the second part of Christian's uh, presentation which we've linked to some of our, our practice at St Christopher's. Thank, thank you Natalie. Okay. Yes, thank you Nat. Um, so yes, I think acquirement is a, a concept that chimes very much with how we're trying to work uh, in the participation team. And I think from like theoretically using Vygotsky, Freire 
and some of the activity theory that you mentioned is really important and the, having this idea that um, young people and the adults need to gradually start to reckon what the resources and what the potential for action they have and that we support them to kind of become aware of that um, and so there is a strong focus in the way we're doing the motivation of young people what motivates them um, activity theory is kind of useful for that so what you were talking about a social approach and seeing um, you know space as a relational um, relational space and also in awareness of the resources that are that are, the rule the laws uh, some of the norms that are that are there are very important and that influence the situation of the young people and where they find themselves in um, when we start working practically when we're working with motivation of the young people I think one of the first barrier that we meet is um, this kind of idea of incentivizing people financially and that's something that in the team we have to work uh, quite hard at kind of uh, helping people understand the, 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 the very different approaches that we have. As, so sanctions and financial incentive are something that uh, we, need, we need to address and we work a lot with the teams. Um, and that has to do with kind of uh, trying to help the adults and the team themselves work with their own insecurities and work with, with a, a space where they can feel happy to, to work with that uh, kind of not knowing that we spoke about when we were having the first questions. Um, and so, the, yeah, the image of the ritual is important for that. Um, so in practice, and I'm aware that is something that people might think, well, this is something that is done very often, but involving young people in recruitment is uh, an example of um, something we do quite regularly. but that kind of brings up all those notions of acquirement and of uh, uh, empowerment. And um, one of so we kind of set up mini work experiences for people if they want to if they want to uh, support uh, staff and managers to recruit uh, um, new candidates okay so i'm just going to conclude by saying some of the other um uh, you know ideas that we meet often um, from the staff uh, and that using this idea of the rich child to help them um kind of include young people in participating is have you so that i was talking about their worry and the kind of overprotectiveness also very often there are there are questions around the young people's uh capacities to concentrate to be able to argue uh from a, you know using the 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 kind of recruitment system um, and also, I think one of the things that's really important is finding ways for the adult to give accurate and, and relevant feedback to the young people about how their ideas have helped them make their decision. And that's a really, really important thing, um, uh, aspect of acquirement because it helps give a different self, you know, the, uh, the kind of self image to the young people and the staff. Uh, and I think often, there, are, there is this realization once young people have participated in the interview that some of those assumptions around who the young people are and what they can do are, are kind of different. Um, and, and that's a small experience of acquirement and conquer, conquering mm -hmm. a different mm -hmm. space, a space that's very mm -hmm. adult and very, very kind of formal, the space of recruitment. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Cecile um clap from everybody um thank you <laughs> thank you so much for that and um great to see the idea of requirement moving from the the physical space to the relational space and the the power space uh, um, between adults and children too so i think we'll move straight on to the lighthouse team now who's going to take the lead from from them is that nicola uh, so I'm going to take the lead Correct. first. You're going um, to take the lead. Who's that? Emmanuel? Are, this is Emmanuel, yeah. Um, there are four of us speaking.
speaking. I think for the five of us speaking, actually. So um, we're going to have to speak quite quite briefly and go through things quite quickly. Um, so to introduce myself, I'm Emmanuel, the founder and director of Lighthouse. I'm just going to start by providing some of the context um, and background of the organisation. So my background personally is in teaching. I used to teach a number of looked after children. It came became apparent through that experience that many of the looked after children that I taught were struggling with school for various reasons. Uh, this realisation inspired um, three years of research into the experiences of children in care and then spe specifically into those growing up in residential care. So our work at Lighthouse focuses on children's homes. Um, so when I was doing my research, I always realised that there was only so much that I was going to learn from the literature and there was a need to understand what was taking place in the front line. So I ended up volunteering in a number of children's homes, some of which had a social pedagogy approach. Um, so I spent some time in a couple of St. Christopher's children's homes, but most of those that I visited um, didn't. Um, I should also note that I've also spent time in Germany and Denmark trying to understand how their homes worked and how they were different and getting an understanding of the practical applications of social pedagogy uh, in other countries. There's an SPBA webinar on that, which I would recommend you visit um, <laughs> if you have the time. Um, so uh, my eventual analysis identifies four key issues in UK residential children's homes, uh, one of which we're going to go in detail about today, but I'll give you an overview of the, the others. And um, Lighthouse was founded essentially to provide an answer to these key challenges and reimagine it uh, reimagine what a children's home um, could be with the aim of setting up a number of social pedagogy informed children's homes over the next few years the first of which will open in Sutton um, early next year um, first among those challenges was the challenge of workforce um, I'm sure we all recognize that attracting staff is hard turnover is high training is not always at the standard that we would hope for. So at Lighthouse, we're taking a new approach to recruitment selection and training. Uh, secondly, uh, education and therapy are not always the uh, priorities that they, they should be. And sometimes that input can be questionable. So we're taking a slightly different approach to that. Um, another key concern is around the methodological um, approaches. And um, where there are methodological approaches, they often fail to put children at the center. Um, and that's why we believe that social pedagogy offers a really useful perspective. Um, but for today's session, we're really going to focus on the challenge that we refer to as the place challenge um, or space challenge. Uh, so place considers all the questions related to the spaces that young people inhabit in residential care. Uh, so we know that one of those challenges is that placements can be unstable and break down um, in ways that could be prevented. Um, so children tend to move place quite frequently. Uh, children's homes are often not in the parts of the country where they're most needed. So, for example, Lighthouse is based in London. We have about a third of the places that we need, whereas the North East has about a quarter of the, the country's um, places. Um, so what that means is that children are often far away from their family and communities, and that reduces the opportunities to work with families. Um, children's homes, um, despite often being in residential properties, can often feel quite institutional and therefore alienate into children. So that's why at Lighthouse we decided to put a huge amount of time into thinking carefully about how to create spaces which are consistent with and conducive to um, the social pedagogy approach. I'm going to pass on to my colleague Nicola, who's going to speak a bit more about how we're trying to address some of the, the issues and challenges at Lighthouse. Hello everyone, I'll keep this short because the really exciting stuff comes after me with the architects we've been working with. But essentially children's homes are one of those concrete spaces to go back to the theory from the first part of Christian's lecture, where you see the enactment of those power imbalances in the relationship to those questions about the relationship between the individual and the state and society and who decides what the physical environment is like in a children's home because those houses send messages about whether it's a home or an institution how they see themselves and their role we asked the architects to focus on creating a physical environment that would support the kind of life space the kind of relationships and communication and create a child-centered environment where children are given opportunities by the building itself to communicate and play and constantly be participating and negotiating the mini community of the home that empower themselves by being able to continually negotiate with adults how that space is used, what it's for. A continuous renewal change is designed into the building along with play so that they should be, it should be a home that invites 
and uh, supports the kind of relationships we want to have and allows for constant renewal and learning where everybody is participant in shaping the space and how it's used. Um, and we've drawn a lot of work of Lucy Park and her research um, and working with our, our architects, Conrad and Georgia, to try and make that real and they've got some stuff to share. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Lucy Parkinson, I'm an architect and the founder of ACE Architectural Consultancy. I'm here today to talk about my research, marginalised children equals marginalised research equals marginalised architecture, an explorative look into residential childcare homes and the positive impact of architecture interventions. Lighthouse invited me here today to talk um, they found my research quite influential and key in helping them design their own new care home. The two main case studies that I looked at throughout this was Zebra's Children's Home for the Future in Denmark and AHMM's North London Hospice. And I had the pleasure of visiting them both. What I found that in England, the use of architecture as a tool to help these care environments, especially in child residential care, is either just not used or overlooked and underutilised. So I created this toolkit for design. It's made up of nine crucial elements to consider when approaching spatial designs and interventions. Firstly, secret efficiency. It has to work, but don't make it obvious. Show that you've invested value into each individual space. Proxemics. The relationship between spaces must follow the order of intimate, personal, social and then public and this must be respected. Autonomy. A child should be able to feel control of their spaces, spaces within homes that they have no control of who lives there. Flexibility. The architecture must have transferable skills and appeal to the economic market. Staff importance. Staff are key. Keep their mental health optimum, increase their retention and work ethic and lower the sick leave. Community. This is a give and take and should encourage children early on to find the benefit to them of engaging in a wider community. Implicit association. Basically, don't go using the same chairs that they'll find at their schools and don't put the same notices up as you would see in a doctor's waiting room. Excellent design. Let them wake up every day knowing that they are valued and that they matter and anything in their life is possible and no limit has been set on them early on. Landscape. Landscape is often as overlooked even more than good design. It's one of the first things to get value engineered out of a scheme, but done correctly, its powers and benefit have an incredible effect on your mental health. When I started to put these theories into practice, it led to further research and understanding of the importance of workshops really early on to help deliver these designs. In care, especially children's care homes, it's fundamental that the designer listens to the user of the service and the ones delivering it. And you can't get this information from a simple A4 questionnaire. The real value comes from out of the box thinking and the ability to gain the trust and respect of these vulnerable and sensitive groups. You must show them you care. You must show them that they are important and that you are listening to their voice. And this is for the staff and the children. Thank you for listening. Please visit aceteam.com to find more information about my research. And if you want to contact me for more information or just for a chat, please email me at info at aceteam.com. Thank you. Uh, I'll now pass on to Conrad and Georgia, who can talk about these practical implications more. Okay. Hi, so I'm, I'm Conrad and um, I run Conrad Kosowski Architects. I'm also a design fellow at the University of Cambridge. Uh, where I teach on the master studio and uh, Georgia and I have been working very closely uh, together on this project now for for uh, quite a number of months um, with uh, with Lighthouse and um, it's been a really fantastic and rare opportunity to spend a good deal of time on the design of um, this type of home um, and inc inc incidentally I think time is, is another component that you know could be 
probably fleshed out uh, a, a bit more through further conversation. But um, uh, so essentially, um, we've we've had uh, the opportunity to visit a number of uh, care homes and have identified uh, a number of problems that that Lucy has has also uh, just identified um, and uh, have found uh, we, that one of our key challenges was to create uh, a project that did not appear institutional um, and uh, you know in, in, in our situation we have um, uh, some more time to actually ap approach the design process in a more holistic way so we can actually start from the very beginning to design some of these things out um, and we saw some very good examples uh, as well of uh, homes that had nurtured a sense of mark making, place making, and so forth. Um, and these are powerful ways in which uh, children have been able to find agency in their homes. Um, so examples that we want to take forward uh, into the designs for, for the new project. Um, so this is the building and um, it currently sits in ruin. Um, it was previously an elderly care home with a fairly damning record of neglect for its occupants. And so I think it serves as a bit of testament to the holistic approach that Lighthouse are taking, that as a team, we're aiming to restore an otherwise neglected building that many would have given up on uh, or discarded. Um, and of course, the way we shape our environment is a direct reflection of society, culture, uh, principles, and so forth. So um, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's, it's quite a statement to actually um, bring this building um, back to back to health so to speak um, and so we're quite sensitive to the possibilities like that a project like this can raise um, so there is a sense of um, creating a a network a local network of um, uh, familiar places that might interact with um, with with the property with the children uh, and that on, on our end in this early stage has to do with supply chains, it has to do with fabricators, um, but also people that might be able to come and fix a window if it breaks. And um, so we're trying very on, uh, very early on to integrate th that kind of thinking. Um, and we had hoped to show a physical model, but this is uh, the, the work in progress of that model that we were going to share at the workshop. But um, uh, it is a really effective tool for communicating um, uh, some of the thinking that we've uh, had and um, so so just to start there's um, this fantastic opportunity that the, the property already lends uh, itself to um, this very deep threshold um, which which touches a bit on uh, what Lucy was describing as um, these these multiple layers of um, thresholds and moving into the property then um, and into some of the designs that we're putting forward um, you can see that we've tried to exaggerate some of these thresholds for bedrooms, for example, um, to, to really distinguish um, that, um, that, that change of space um, and also creating more ambiguous spaces uh, to linger. Uh, um, and also uh, areas that are ambiguous on the, on the ground floor as well um, that uh, might provide space for a child uh, to, to spend some time without having to necessarily hide away in the bedroom. Um, so um, then we also have um, a principle of creating multiple exits and entries for the, for the sake of creating a sense of safety for the children um, in, each, in each room. Um, so pretty much every single space on the ground floor has multiple exit and entry points. So this kind of constant uh, push and pull between openness and uh, thresholds and, and what remains uh, closable as well. Um, and uh, it's important to note as well the um, interactive uh, surfaces throughout um, the project which enable a sense of agency for the children so that they're able to to kind of make their mark as well um, and, and then uh, this is a view of the kitchen and dining area and the um, external uh, rear um, garden and uh, again, you can see um, these deep thresholds, um, uh, a kind of constant uh, sense that there, there are viewpoints across the, across the ground floor um, without it being an open plan. Um, and that's very much all come out of um, working very closely with, uh, with, oh, um, with uh, Lighthouse 
Um, and then these are some images. I don't know if I'm already past my two minutes or not. Yeah, you, you need to, yeah, you need to okay. wrap up. Yeah. That's okay. Um, I just think these are some uh, material examples. Uh, of, um, the, this is an image of one of the bedrooms, again, showing these interactive spaces and a deep threshold, a kind of corridor that separates. Um, and then just a, a sense of materiality um, yeah. and uh, the importance of, of using materials that can age, that can show marks being made over time without um, looking as though they're damaged, that it's important to have some kind of continuity in a sense of time. So I'll leave it there um, with this image of Jamie's farm, which I think is really <laughs> fantastic and helps to summarize some of what we're after. Thank you very much. That's absolutely brilliant. And I shall be in touch with you about something else. Um, I think we better move on to Tours. Um, presentation to allow a few minutes at the end for some discussion. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I was logged in on my phone first and then I got logged out like five minutes ago and panicked because oh. it was in the, 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 the great thing. So I got back in, which was wonderful. And now I can see you all because I'm on my laptop. Aren't <laughs> you all gorgeous? <laughs> nice, to, nice to see you all. I know many of you and those that I don't know, nice to meet you too. I'm sitting here just to show you many are in the same position there's the, my kids den behind me I've got paint down my leg and everything is in lockdown mode mess but there's an opportunity in that somewhere I'm, I'm sure of that there's something about this whole situation that many of us are forced into that's going to teach us something about that's my reflection anyway the, the bad part of doing this at the end of two amazing presentations from Christian Spacek and then what we just heard is that whatever you wanted to talk about really isn't the same. You've had so much great stuff to hear other people say you question everything you put together before that. But I'm going to try and go with it. How long do I have, Claire? I'm guessing you have a little 10 less minutes. Time. Okay, cool. So we will still have the, the amount yeah. of time. So my, my, my input to this, I had called square pegs. And uh, it's, it comes from the, the saying square pegs through round holes. It's a very familiar British term. I'm sure Christian and others who may not live in Britain are well aware of it as well. And the reason I've fallen out of love with it, as, especially as I've sat here for the last hour and a half and listened to so many great things, is that there's something in the premise of what I felt I was going to talk about today, which actually doesn't sit well with me. So I'm sort of falling out of love with it, if you like. But I'll sort of explain what I hope to talk about anyway. So the idea was that, that I think uh, social pedagogy, due to its uh, holistic premise and its very humanistic purpose, um, can, can sit uneasily with demands for measurability. I think that's, that's something I feel we know. That's something we have seen over, over, over time. You know, there's something about the way that we hope to approach uh, our work and our way of being, which is really more about being a human being than about applying method, um, specific method to what we do, I think. Um, and that doesn't, it doesn't really matter, I think, whether it's uh, as practitioners in the way, we, whether it's the way we manage or teach within whatever profession we're in, the idea that we are able to be, as a human being, uh, a, a role model for the values, uh, for the ethical, sort of, uh, you could say, uh, rock sack that we're carrying is actually in some respects probably the biggest part of our capability towards people when it comes to creating and then um, promoting social change. This is a view of mine anyway. Um, and so, so the idea then is that really in a way, because we carry that attitude or we, we would like to carry that attitude, that our dexterity with the role and potential of uh, understanding of, of understanding space, understanding, um, uh, you know, uh, the idea of opportunities, educational opportunities that may show themselves, the idea of the common third, uh, things like inclusion and understanding the real depth of those terms and being able to somehow translate that sometimes into a practice setting or a life situation that does not really, that is not really very conducive to those types of things. That is in a way our dexterity in this country, I feel. This is the British version of what, uh, if I were to talk as a, as a as Danish person who's grown up in a different place, which is not the place of milk and honey. There's so many unhelpful myths about places like Denmark and I'm sure Germany as well. Um, but when you grow up in a place where there is a subtext to, to um, social pedagogy, well, pedagogy in this case, which has to do with a um, priority given 
to to things like inclusion in the real depth of the term and priority giving to 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 the value of human beings and human learning just for the sake of that alone with there being a uh, you could say a, a a back end objective to it then you come to a different country and then i'm beginning to wonder having heard what christian and others said i also love the acquirement term i'm beginning to wonder whether the risk is that social pedagogy can uh, <laughs> can you could say find its own way of acquirement here uh, in the, in this yeah. country uh, by yeah. by um uh, what could you say by finding the things that it, that resonates but not necessarily being able to carry all the things into in into uh, that setting within which it resonates which actually makes it what it is i hope that doesn't sound sort of too 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 hairy to listen to what what i'm thinking about here is the idea of uh, so so to come back to what my my quarrel now is with my own objective for the workshop that i would have done if we'd been in the room together and i've given some examples is that i think the idea of square pegs through round holes is really in a way a good example of what that can sometimes feel like you are here with a certain value base but you are actually uh, needing somehow to produce an output or something in a format or in a way that actually does not give uh, lend itself or give full justice to the breadth of the work that people need to do human development and uh, human complexity is enormous and human potential too and the idea of being able to quantify that or push it through uh, is, is uh, in some ways impossible so that has led me to dislike what I actually came with because in some ways I'm thinking why are we talking about square why am I talking about square pegs instead of talking about changing the box through which I'm pushing these pegs, presumably. In other words, rather than uh, putting square pegs through round holes, why don't we create a better way <laughs> of measuring, uh, of, of looking at these sorts of things? And so the reason I, I think that's that's relevant is that what I do, I should explain as a as a uh, sort of as my job and my role within this is I worked I worked mainly to deliver training and also to do projects around um, practice development of different kinds. So recently. I have um, worked with WEA around social prescribing. It's not a, a field of, of thinking I, I love that much, but it's something that I was asked to consult on for WEA. Lois, who's here, and Jamil and Claire and others uh, lent, lent me their brains for a little bit for that. Uh, that is a good example of a way in which um, a certain dominant thinking around health becomes, um, you could say, um, becomes a bit of a... Uh, a you could say a, vest, a vehicle through which you could then put all the best strength-based approaches in the world but the subtext will still not be the right subtext perhaps is my view of that so this is an example of of of, of my 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 problem with it really is that um it is as though um i'm trying to find out where to go with this so as though rather than talking about how we best um uh, how we best uh, interact ourselves, how we best enact ourselves in our practice, we should take a step back and wonder whether this is actually not a lot more political <laughs> than we than we give it credit for. And with that, I guess, comes for me the question that I'd like to ask, really, to the group here, which is to do with um, how, they, how they see themselves in political change. Uh, in other words, um, social pedagogy is obviously, as so many other things, a... A, 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 you could say of promoting um, social change but are we doing enough to ask the big questions and to push on the big doors for those changes to happen that's some that's a question i would like to ask uh, to people um, i feel not and that's why i ask but could i hear someone yeah um did you hear the discussion earlier on at the end of part one of the lecture i may not have heard it my, i may have been out at that point so oh yeah yeah so um we, we had a, a discussion about the need to move to a political, uh, a more politically uh, described, per subscribed space in, uh, for social pedagogy in the UK um, in various ways, whether it's working with communities first or yeah. institutions first. So that's a really good point at which to, um, to bring the conversation back to yeah. how we can collaborate um, with the German tradition a bit more. Yeah. Um, which is, what? is there more that you wanted to say? No, well, it was just actually to summarize it back 
to the point, sort of in a way, just to bring it back, what, what, what my question, I was writing this really while listening to what, what the Christian was saying, was a little bit about what cognitive and ethical diet we're feeding the social and health and education in, in um, you know, uh, sectors, for example. We talk a lot about, um, we talk a lot about, and so I don't meet in my, and I don't think Melissa, who's here and works with me, I don't feel I meet, and uh, Jamil too, I don't feel I ever meet um, hardly anyone in a room that I sit in who comes there, of course, to learn social pedagogy to discuss it, who, is, who isn't in, or more or less entirely in agreement with everything that social pedagogy is all about. I don't actually think I very often meet anyone who, who you know, profoundly disagrees with any part of it. So it makes me think about this idea of what, of, of, of the, the, the subtext, because I've grown up in this, um, this social democratic subtext. It makes me, 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 me wonder whether uh, you could say the, the professions that work with the social professions in this country are actually fed the right diet, you could say, are actually sort of given, you could say, um, the, the right ethical and uh, cognitive prerequisite to do their work. And that funding, of course, is included here. And, 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 and it's almost like perhaps if, uh, perhaps if, you, if you see workforces out there doing that, all that important work and being, being cut back, I suppose, you could wonder whether actually they're, um, they're being given crackers. <laughs> for every for every meal time instead of whatever they need whatever their body needs does that make sense and so the idea for me of measurability the idea of becoming overly tangible and overly quanti quantifying in how you measure things is a symptom of that i feel it's almost yeah. as though really the value of human beings in their own right isn't isn't justification enough okay and I have a thank problem. you Sorry. thank you to that's um it's really good that it's a, a critique of where we're at at the moment in terms of trying to push social pedagogy in the UK because it may be that it's fundamentally not reaching the targets that are required in order to achieve a social pedagogic revolution. I think we're running a bit short of time, but um, we've got about 15 minutes for um, general comments, particularly around connections between the social spatial approaches that you heard and what you saw in the in the three presentations. Who would like to kick off? Hi. Just unmute yourself. Hi, is that Isabel? Yes. Hi. Hello. Hello, Hi. everybody. It's really interesting the conversation. Um, I'm a Spanish and I'm pedagogue, although I live in Edinburgh, and I work in as a youth worker. So having been here for a long time and see how a youth worker or try to implement a pedagogy in UK, for me it's a really interesting point because I see people um, pedagogy social pedagogy. Let's see, everybody does social pedagogy at the same time as social educator as well, but it's like it's not reflected on paper. But everything what we do, just be working as a youth worker or residential homes, uh, pedagogy, because pedagogy is the science of education, but we are just focused in not formal site. So being the example of the lighthouse, we have so many projects in Spain, I used to work there, so it, it's quite similar. So I think UAK is in the right path to achieve good pedagogy and be recognized for everybody as a, as a new position job between communities. Um, that is, that's what's my opinion. So I don't think, I think it's, it's more to be aware of the theory and because what I find out also, and I'm going to finish with that point, is people know people people know what what to do, but they don't know the theory. So maybe it's that is the gap. Yeah, I That's agree. It. I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you as You're well. Welcome. More comments. I can't see the whole of you. Yeah, can I say something? Yes, please. Um, I, like, I wonder if the work that we've done in the UK in terms of working, trying to implement social pedagogy within statutory services, actually we're kind of 
trying to really, like in French we say you go and you attack the cliff, kind of go and find the hardest place because it's so, so controlled, so, so regulated. And maybe actually with SPA and with other, there should be a conscious effort to work much more in terms of um, more, more community setting, some work more like around now, you know, like how can we be uh, involved in two circles of mutual help in, in neighborhood and those kind of things. And I, I mean, so that actually we, we kind of have that, that, then the political dimension that we were talking about can be brought up, brought in a different manner. And there isn't so much resistance because of statutory services being so regulated. Okay. Um, Ali, where are you? I can't see you, but you're next. Ali? Hi. Yeah, are you there? Um, okay, there you are. Uh -huh. um, well, I think I raised my hand quite a while ago, actually. So, um, but um, it, around the comment, it was around Haltung, actually. But uh, for me, I think there's so many parallels here in terms of um, work with adults. Mm -hmm. Everything that we've talked about today is just there's so much application there. Even the stuff around the physical, system, thinking about residential homes for older people um, and then the other part was thinking around how long was one of the comments that I was originally going yes. to make was that um, that some of the work that I've been doing with um, local authorities and leadership teams around um, thinking about how uh, about culture change within their organizations and trying to introduce social pedagogy as part of that how is the one thing that they all really grasped quickly and like um, so it's definitely something and for them it seems to make that connection which is something that's deeper than just a value base that there is this kind of congruence with practice um, and thinking about what are the behaviors that would demonstrate that 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 those values were in practice so there's some real opportunity i think to and particularly where we are in terms of thinking about leadership in crisis and thinking about where social pedagogy fits within this that, that for me, it feels like the, those windows of opportunity are, are really there for us at the moment. Thank you very much, Ali. Look forward to taking that further. Um, Gabriel is, was in next. Yeah. Um, hi, guys. I'm really struck by Christian's kind of focus on the social philosophical kind of background to social pedagogy and how, how much that is a really strong tradition and i think that really clashed with with our focus in the uk on evidence-based manualized standardized practice and i wonder to what extent we need to just bring back some of the deeper questions mm -hmm. that help us rethink and reflect on our health tongue that 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 have very much to do with our philosophical stance towards this world towards people you know like what is the individual social relationship what do we want the relationship to be between individuals and their communities and what can we actually do to nurture that um and i think you know particularly in this crisis where we see communities coming together there are real opportunities and mm -hmm. um for for us to kind of yeah fi find ways to bring back those deeper questions about what is it that connects us and how can we achieve that in practice um, you know, how can we create spaces that, that bring people together where we can have these reflections, these deeper questions about what it means to be human. That's something that I think is, is going to help us um, make sure that we're not just focused on, on training or not just focused on practice, but that we're focused on the, mm -hmm. the philosophical underpinnings of it as well. Mm -hmm. And the idea of evidence behind that. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else have their hand up that I haven't seen yet? Or would anybody like to make a contribution to it? Just to say, I think, sorry, did I interrupt someone? Uh, uh, I don't know who it was, if you did. Go Gabriel's ahead. Point, hi Gabriel, uh, summarises exactly the, the, the problem I feel I'm seeing in it, that we, in a way, need to sort of almost take a stock a little bit I think the whole idea of the, the very big humanity of, of, of what we're doing is extremely important. And it was perhaps my experience of joining this social prescribing train that made me feel as though 
uh, it's a bit of a time to be careful and not become instrumentalized. And perhaps I think mm-hmm. what Gabriel said there really is a good example mm-hmm. in all aspects of what we do in, in everywhere we do it is to, to take stock a little bit and reconnect a little bit with the, with the core purpose. Of, yeah. So thank you. Okay. So Nicola, did you want to say what you just put in your chat box? <laughs> Yeah, just just think I have been thinking a great deal about the fact that the lived experience of going through social isolation is yeah. causing people to become aware at a, a profound sensory hermeneutic level of what does it mean to be human and what is it when you are taken away from even the most casual contact and sense of belonging and community beyond your household. So I think that not in the moment of crisis itself, but afterwards, there are potentially conditions within which the, the, the wider agenda of growing a social pedagogic um, network of connected activities taking forward developments in different ways across the country, I think that becomes possible because I think there is a moment that will come after the crisis where there's a space for debating as a society, what are the kind of relationships that we want to have with each other in communities to enable everybody in the society to be fully human through mm-hmm. being participant. Mm-hmm. And that that will be understood and felt by people who perhaps because of, of, of the privilege in their lives and their own connections haven't really felt what that means before. Yeah. And, and those conditions to perhaps be hopeful about for later. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Isabel's put her hand up. Anybody else want to make a contribution before we wind up? Yeah, can I can I just add yep. something quickly? Yep. So I've just put it on the chat, but this made me really think about um, the pedagogy of recognition that I've just very recently come across because of Robin, and I'm blown away by it. And this is <laughs> it. It's this idea that, you know, relationships are fundamental to our development, and if we don't have positive relationships, then we don't develop. But recognition and being human and having human dignity is absolutely key to all of this. And, um, you know, Jensen's uh, work around, I'm just looking at my notes because I've been scribbling away frantically. Um, You know, Jensen's notes around what social pedagogy is. And it's about developing goals along the way, not at the start. It's about collaborative and active participation and goal setting. It's about acknowledgement that there's different ways of getting to that goal, but actually all of them can be valid. And that everyday life has to be used for development and helping people, you know, using life spaces is really important. So I just think, you know, now, yeah, things are absolutely awful and we're in a crisis, but actually getting back to, pedagogy of recognition and relationships we've got a real opportunity i think yes i think so it's um question of what whether spa or or community practice needs to be structuring that opportunity in some way um and maybe i should just turn to robin now and say as chair of spa what you would like people who are participating today to to kind of cohere around or will contribute to the ongoing debate thanks yeah what we would really like to do is to invite you to suggest where we go from here so we'd like to do more webinars um i think this this first one has gone really well christian awesome thank you Um, i'm particularly um and i didn't draw it out uh, in, in, uh, in enough detail but i'll come back to it but the triangle that you looked that, that you, you presented at the end. I think that is going to be my kind of real focus over the next few months. Um, but what we would really like to hear from people is ideas for future webinars and future collaborations. But particularly, I had a discussion with Nicola yesterday and she was saying she'd be really interested to hear how people are using social pedagogy in the lockdown. So lockdown social pedagogy, we would really like to hear from you about how social pedagogy is helping you or making you think about things in a different way or um, uh, what does what does it mean now at this moment in time for people's practice? Because the space that we're working in is also very different. I don't know about others, but now I'm taking all the work that I'm doing with families online and, and with various other meetings and how that's a, a, in some ways it's 
awesome and it's much better. Um, in other ways, it's really problematic. So it, th this is a particularly interesting time, I think, for social pedagogy. And um, for me, uh, Christian, you were talking about the political and there was a, quite a lot of chat about the political. This, I think, is the opportunity where we need to really mobilise, but mobilise in, a, in a, a very kind of, perhaps in a, a more structured way than we have been. Uh, in that perhaps all the 46 people on this um, this video, uh, at the webinar, could contact their MPs. Because this, what is going on in, in local areas at the moment is very much informed by social pedagogy if people knew about social pedagogy. So it's a great opportunity for us to highlight where social pedagogy is alive and well and thriving right now. Yeah. But yeah, and you mentioned the other day about um, blogs and yes. stories of the lockdown as blog pieces. Yeah, as blog pieces. So at the moment we're um, publishing a series of blogs um, which are, are vaguely uh, uh, linked to the idea of journey, which is why it was particularly interesting to have this um, webinar with Christian today because um, the, the destination, the, the space, the place, uh, is also really important but um, at the moment what we're we're looking for is uh, we're going to hold hopefully our conference in November and it will be about social pedagogy journeys so we want to to, to um, invite people to, to write about the journey that they're on at the moment um, in terms of the lockdown in terms of, of how does it how does it feel to practice in this very odd way and are there groups you're particularly finding hard to reach or you can, like, I'm, I'm worried about care leavers myself. How are they faring out there? How, yeah. how, are, how are they managing to, to get by in this strange conditions when personally I'm really reliant on family and if you haven't got family around you, how are you managing? And this is the, the major concern at the moment uh, is for care leavers. Also with the um, there's a new bill that's being uh, passed at the moment. They're looking to suspend a lot of legislation and one of the parts of that suspension would be uh, uh, support to care leavers. So actually there, there's a lot of political work that we need to be doing. Article 39 are a really good charity who are really trying to uh, force this, this onto a wider agenda. So please do follow them. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, it, it's it's really difficult out there and um, when we're talking with families online um, you know the the idea that you have a private conversation with somebody is often yeah. very impossible yeah. um, lots of families do not have broadband do not have um, any internet links um, have have limited access to telephones so yeah uh, we are getting increasingly worried and certainly in Hackney 30% of the workforce is down so you know we have very few people to actually uh, to do any work and the only people who are being sanctioned to, to go out and do visits are social workers when there is an immediate child protection concern so pre-existing child protection concerns are not seen in the same light as they are today, which I think also helps us to really think through our child protection concerns mm -hmm. a bit more mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. deeply now, to think mm -hmm. about what are the relationships, how are those working in these circumstances? So I think it's, it's a great opportunity for us as social pedagogues to, to uh, try and level this um, evidence-based practice environment that we're um, finding, well, personally, I find rather toxic. But they yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> so um, a few people on the chat have asked for a reconvening of this uh, group on a on a Zoom basis. Is that something Spark can facilitate? Absolutely. And in what interval? Maybe a month's time. Um, on a similar kind of twelve till basis. Find out what people are doing. What there were opportunities for action seeing. Um, First Friday at till two is Gabriel's suggestion. First Friday of the month is that, um, which I guess today is. Yeah. Um, so the beginning of May be the first of May is a Friday, and then so on. Um, okay, so that sounds like an action plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to finish now because we've gone two o'clock. But I'm 
absolutely delighted by the way it's gone today. And um, I'd really like to thank both Christian and all of the presenters who have worked hard to produce the content for today, made it available to all of us, and, um, and also Adriana for facilitating today's work, which was quite a lot of organization to get it, to get it up and running. Mm -hmm. If we do want to have a, um, a regular session with Zoom, you, you, you need to link to sign in. So uh, we'll, have, we'll have to work out a mechanism for that. Yeah. Maybe we'll just send the link round to everybody who's signed up today and then um, you either sign in or you don't sign in. Um, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. But um, yeah, be really good. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Yeah. And I hope to see you on the other side at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Oh, yeah. Christian. Yeah. Also, uh, thanks very much for inviting me in that situation. And uh, I think we did a very inspiring seminar. I think we have been talking about a lot about the thing, what is a good life? What, what does a good life mean about Haltung, theory, values, mm -hmm. and also society and individuals? So I think we did a really inspiring workshop. And it, it was, uh, I'm happy that I could be part of that. So thanks very much for having me. Feel free to come back another time, Christian. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, maybe yeah. In, uh, in November. We... In lockdown, so maybe that's possible again in May. Sounds yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. We'll say goodbye. And thanks to Claire Thank for sharing. Well done. Yes, yeah. also. Thank, you, for Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.